1 John chapter 4 tells us in two different places, verse 8 and verse 16, this simple but profound statement, God is love. Please be seated. My dear friends in Christ Jesus, our Lord, God is love. What an amazing thing for me to be able to proclaim to you because it's true and because God's word tells us it's true. Now, love makes all the difference, doesn't it? Makes all the difference. And one way it makes all the difference is when it comes to communicating with text, communicating with words, right? Now, I'm going to ask you to participate today. I'm going to be bold. I'm going to do it. What are ways that we communicate purely by text? Start naming them out. Texting? That's a good one. I was hoping we'd get that one today. <laughs> a letter? So old school writing a letter, right? Other? Email? Books? I heard books, right? Okay. Other? Poetry? Okay. Birthday cards? Is there an agenda behind that one? <laughs> yeah. Huh? Memes. I'm glad you said that. Uh, I know memes are a pretty big thing right now. And then uh, nobody's saying like ICQ or anything like that or bulletin boards or old tech that way. Nobody's going to go that way. Any other text communications? Yeah. T-shirts. You and my son would have fun talking about those. Yep. Okay. Other things? Parables, yeah. yeah. If they're written down, we can call that text. Sure. I heard something out there. Bumper stickers. There we go. Okay. I think we got the idea, right? There's lots of ways. What about good old-fashioned notes? Like a post-it note or something. Uh, we would, when I was a kid, we would put notes on the door sometimes to let people know what was going on if we were going to be out because we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have the ability to text somebody. So we'd have to leave a note, right? Now, what's the problem with all of those different types of text communication? I'm going to tell you what that problem is. Unless the tone is actually written into that text communication, you don't know what it is, right? You don't know what the tone of that text is. And that, I know, can get us into some pretty big trouble, right? If we don't know what the tone is, even if the words are completely right, if the words are completely understandable, right? So I got a couple of messages here. Uh, let's say you're a child and you get a note from your parent that says, come, comma, see me. Why is everybody laughing at that? <laughs> okay, we're laughing at that because, uh-oh, is one of the thoughts that we're thinking, right? Now, the parent might want you to come and see that parent because they want to give you something nice or whatever, but the, one of the thoughts that pops in our head is, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Okay, here's another one. You're in a long-standing relationship with someone, and you get a note from that person that says, we need to talk exclamation point. Okay, people are chuckling about that one too. Hmm. Well, it might be a good conversation, right? We need, no. <laughs> uh, we need to talk, especially the exclamation point, right? We need to talk. And, and, and so we have a thought. I bet all of us would think it, uh-oh, right? That's going through our mind too. Now, we can combine those two thoughts when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to the scriptures as God speaks to us through his word. It is written communication. God has promised that his word would always be with us. And it's a written word. It's, it's communication, right? And perhaps the simplest condemnation that we could read from the Bible comes to us from Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death. Now, the question then is, what's the tone of that statement? We often hear that statement in isolation, but the tone of that statement, when we take it in context, when we take it in the rest of the verse and the rest of that section from Romans 6, is about 
the eternal life that Jesus Christ has won for us, the love of God in saving us from our sins. Here's the rest of the verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus the Lord. Love makes all the difference. It makes all the difference when it comes to the tone of our scriptures. And in our reading for today from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the end part, going into 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the beginning 13 verses of that section, we see the tone that God gives to us when it comes to his word for us. And it's a beautiful tone. Love is what makes all of the difference when we read about the communication that God gives to us in his word. It's printed in your worship folder under the gospel or the second lesson for today, 1 Corinthians 12, 27 to 13, 13. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those who speak in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? And there, by the way, the Greek is begging you to answer no. That's the type of construction that is in the original language but eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love makes all the difference when it comes to God's gifts to us. In this sermon, we could focus on so many things that we could be here for hours, all the way till like 7 or 8 at night, right? And, and I don't think anybody has anything going on this evening. <laughs> I think we're going to focus a little bit, though, on the gifts that God has given to us and how we use those gifts and the attitude we have as we, we make use of the gifts that God gives to his body of believers, to his people in the Holy Christian Church. And, and love makes all the difference when it comes to God's gifts to us in our lives. It's easy to look at someone else who's a member of the Holy Christian Church, the, the body of believers in Jesus Christ that transcends time and space, the, the body of believers we just professed in the Nicene Creed in the third article, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. And it's really easy to be jealous. It's easy to be jealous of someone else's gifts. Pastors are like this too, by the way. Right? You get to a pastor's conference and you see all these gifts that God has given to the church and you go, oh my, my, that's not me. Right? 
See, I use bad grammar there. I'm not perfect. That's not I. It's better grammar, right? You look at all of God's gifts to the church. And you could look at a prophet. A prophet could say, well, I'm jealous of the apostles. Why? Because the, the apostles, they got to, to see Jesus. They got to look back on Jesus. I'm a prophet. I only get to point forward to Jesus. But they both got to write the Bible, right? It's amazing how jealousy can creep into a body of believers. Spiritual gifts, they're listed in verse 28 of our reading. And God gives them at various times to different people in history. We read about that. It says here, And in the church, God has appointed first of all pro apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Now these gifts are not given to God's people to make us jealous of one another. That's not the purpose. That's why the first verse all the way back up in chapter 12, verse 27, is that you are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. This is not a jealousy thing for us. God ranks, though, some of the gifts. He ranks, first of all, apostles. Then he says, second, prophets. And then third, he talks about teachers. Those who have those roles of bringing God's word directly to his people are prime roles. Prophets were called to bring God's word to God's Old Testament people and to point forward to Jesus Christ. The apostles were called to bring God's word to God's New Testament people and to point back to Jesus Christ, the center of the scriptures, our Savior from our sin. And then we have these other gifts that are listed that God gives to us as, as they support the word as it goes out into the world. You get teachers, right? Teachers who take the word out timelessly and these teachers have people supporting them with miracles of healing and helping and organizing and speaking in tongues. We read all of these gifts that God gives to his church. And these spiritual gifts are good. They're from God. They are good things. But... What keeps someone who has God's gift of administration, right, and volunteers that gift of administration for the benefit of the body of believers, say, in a congregation, right, from being jealous, from being jealous of the, the called worker, the called worker, the teacher, or the pastor that, that makes their living from that word in the congregation? What, what keeps that person from becoming jealous? Or what keeps the called worker from becoming jealous of the lay person's ability to, to minister in ways that that called worker never can and to help in ways that the called worker never can? What keeps pastors and teachers from being jealous? In the face of jealousy, God encourages us instead to, to cultivate, to use the gifts that he has given to us. We read the end of, verse, uh, end of chapter 12 and the beginning of chapter 13, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. Now, how's that going to play out? Well, I'm going to show you. I'll show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. What's his point there? What is a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal? It's nothing but noise, right? Noise, just nothing. All right? If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. He calls himself nothing. And he goes on, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain, I earn nothing. None of it matters if you don't have the right motivation, right? Love makes all the difference. It makes all of the difference when it comes to our abilities and how we use them. The motivation for our abilities Jealousy comes into the church when we, when we praise an, an eloquent person for being just eloquent but not loving. And in turn, that eloquent person becomes vain. 
and does not love. Jealousy comes into the church when, when we praise someone for being successful and just successful, but not loving. And then the so-called successful person is not loving either in vanity. Or how about that flashy person, right? The one with the skills. That flashy person, we praise them. We praise them for their flashiness, but not their love. And then what happens? Well, jealousy comes into the church, and, and, and there's vanity for that flashy person, too, not, not love. And then we look at Jesus. We look at our Christ. We look at our Savior, and to our shame, we see what he's like in Isaiah chapter 53. He was oppressed and afflicted, Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Not eloquent, but silent. And loving. Entirely loving. Not successful, in a worldly sense anyway. No, slaughtered. And loving, and loving. Not flashy, not at all. Oppressed, and loving. Jesus Christ, entirely loving. Jesus is the most gifted person to ever walk the earth. Ever. He's the one that gifted humanity with the divinity of the Godhead. Think about that. The most gifted person to ever walk the earth, and he did it in perfect humility for the benefit of his body, for us, for you, and for me. And then Jesus gives that perfect life that only he could live, and he dies on the cross humbly, humbly for our vanity and for our jealousy, and he does it in love. It takes the power of God to save us from all of our sin. So what does love really look like? And we find out in this reading. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That's the tone. That's the tone of God's, come and see me, we need to talk. That's the tone that he's recorded for us in the word forever. Love makes all of the difference, and there's no way that we can misinterpret what God's Word says. Is there strong law in the Word? Yes, absolutely. But the gospel is so beautiful, too. And anybody that would say the Bible is an unloving book and the God of the Scriptures is nothing but a God that hates and is mean and punishes has not read the Bible. The Bible talks about a God of love. The God of love who took care of real sin for real sinners like you and me, who provides salvation as a free gift because he gave his life for our vanity and for our jealousy. A real God, the real God for real people. This is the God of love in the scriptures. Come now, Isaiah 1 tells us. Let's reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. God talks to us and he tells us that we get to grow in the love that he's not only shown to us but given to us as members of his body. 
verses 8 to 10 tell us love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. Who's the we here? It's us. You're going to call me on the bad grammar this time? It's us? What should it really be? It's we. But it sounds weird, doesn't it? It's talking about us here. I'm trying to bring that out to draw our attention to it. He's talking to us here. Now, in love, God leads us, this forgiven body of believers, this forgiving body of believers as well, and each one of us, an indispensable part of the body of believers, each of us, each and every one of us, we all have eternal life in Christ. Verses 9 to 12, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now, we see but a poor reflection is in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love makes all of the difference when it comes to our attitudes. And here's the loving attitude that God teaches us. This is the tone that God sets in his word for the scriptures. If we're not all going to heaven, then we're not going. And that's how much he loved us. That's how we define love, self-sacrifice. He gave himself for us. And he teaches us his loving way, as he said in, in John chapter 6, this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me but raise them up at the last day. So God gives us faith in his saving work to look outside of ourselves. He has us look outside of ourselves and teaches us what love is because he looked outside of himself to come for us and give himself for us. And we all look outside of ourselves and what do we see? We recognize that each and every one of the people sitting around us, each and every one of the people who confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior to the glory of God the Father is a part of the body of Christ. It's a part of the body of believers. It's someone that we walk with in love to heaven. And that's, that's what love looks like. And the body of believers with Christ as its head will remain forever in heaven. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love makes all the difference. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus the Lord unto life everlasting. Amen.